Hello, I'm Sam so Wilson from the University of Cambridge and Norwich as well. Actually, I'm very happy to be here to talk about Canada and uh, present our report to the from Norwich. Um, okay, for anyone who doesn't know Norwich before, uh, Norwich is a non for profit organization based in Cambridge, start from the University of Cambridge. Um, what we do is we try to provide all sorts and culture free clinics, okay, all castles in platforms. That means we try to open source from the core to launch the internet and even hand IPs which we are allowed to open source. And uh, it's also free and usage in academic and for commercial as well. Uh, we utilize the rocket core as the application core, so that means we've got 64 bit systems. We also uh, decide to use our inner cores as our main cores. So this Cognino course will be used as I.O. processors which allow you to uh, redefine I.O. devices after the cloud. And instead, uh, the rocket core is implemented in Chilo, but we provide a system world up level in the top level. So that means if you add a I.O. device that's on the on-chip internet, you don't need to uh, design devices in, in Chilo. You can do that in system a lot. Um, we do provide two features which separate from anyone else. We provide pack memory, which is a general purpose pack memory, although our focus is more on this hardware security side. We also pro provide mini cores to provide IO processors. And we adopt a code of open bound plan. That means we try to share as much as possible, um, and we try to encourage community efforts. And in the future, we plan to do regular take out. In this paper, we will adopt the contributions from the communities and they include us into our data power just so in a way it's up to community to come to your job to lower it. Um, so the final target for us is to try to be the next sort of hardware wall. That means we try to build our community around the five uh, processors. Here we shall say history of our uh, release in before and uh, now. So we got three previous releases. The first release is about time memory, although that one is very simple. We only provide instruction to read and write the path into the cache or in memory. Um, after that, we think the ARM core using Zip and PK is a problem that we can't run the whole system into a standalone APK. So we managed to replace ARM and allow the rocket core to run standalone. We call it untapped SOC, that's the second release. Then in last year, we add a trace bag into the rocket chip. That means you can uh, collect the trace information, including the instruction trace and so including user defined software trace from the, uh, from the program. Uh, this allows you to do some debugging without actually stop the processor, which is also the perfect way to do logical debugging. Um, so today is our fourth release. Um, it will provide a whole new redesign of the tag memory. And uh, the first time we got the SD interfaces. So the tag memory, uh, this time we think we can call it a general purpose tag memory. So it doesn't only give you instructions to read and write tags into the memory when you practice. This time we have some reading functions into the pipeline state. That means you can control the propagation from source record to destination records. Also, we've got some patch chats. So if the tag is not what you expect, you can raise exceptions. And in the future, we will gradually improve the tag memory and mean core functions. Um, and we will soon merge up to date uh, uh, release from user and sci-fi to get the latest rocket chip. That means we'll get a general feature controller when we buy that technology too. Um, and after that, we see the platform will be stable, then we can go uh, convert into a regular release cycle. So here shows the overall structure of this release. As you can see there, we uh, can use a number of rocket chips as the multi-core application codes. Um, the blue part is all implemented in Chilo, and it can include multiple rocket chips, uh, every chip code. Private L1 patches, including tracking gap, get patch. We've got the multi band L2 shared L2 patches. Uh, then outside the Chilo land, we've got several wire devices implemented in system, including township, taxi, bus system. Um, 
And this time on the fourth and right corner, you can see there is a medium substance on the nucleus by a polyphenol. Also attached to that medium substance, you can see this as B carbon. So that's the new stuff. This time we used the medium called the nucleus the full ASB driver um, instead of the ASBI mode ASB in the previous release. <coughs> Okay, um, so I start from the first speech at the general term of tag membrane. Um, why am I who doesn't know what the tag membrane is? Tag membrane means you have a, you attach a small tag every 64 bit double word. Um, that means we start a tag in that day, a pretty critical number of patients. Uh, and, um, and we saw the tags in the amount of cats, um, and also in the final uh, memory. But there's a problem if we attach tags to every letter words in the cache. Um, we can't do the same for the DDR memory, as DDR memory normally doesn't allow, allow us to change the values. So instead of doing that, we reserve a tag addition in the, in the DDR memory. That means the last level cache needs to send out two requests to fetch the data and the tag. Uh, this will double over hash to the DDR memory. So instead of doing that, we add a tag cache in between the last level cache and the memory. Therefore, the tag can be cached in the tag cache. We don't actually need to uh, access the memory for the tag information. So in the previous slides, you can see the tag cache there just between the L2 and the DDR memory. And this time, we have added building support for tag manipulation and tracking called pipeline. That means you have a detailed control of how the cats are propagated from raster file to memory and uh, source raster to dustbin raster and even to the PC. Um, we also add trackers, that means if there's anything wrong with the cat, you can raise the subject. Um, there are a lot of potential use cases of using tag memory. One way to do it is to protect the code pointers. For example, if you think the, the code pointers should, shouldn't be changed, you can tap the code pointer. So if anyone else tries to write that point that is always accepted, so no one else can change that. And also this could allow you to do some hardware system control flow integration. What does that mean is you can, if you got a branch, uh, you, you can tap the target address. That means you make sure the branch always branch jump into a location you know is secure. If jump to another location which is not secure, you know maybe some hackers are changing your return address. Um, also, there's an interesting way to use tags to do some infinite hardware memory watch point. So for, data, for every data word, you can tag the data word. And every time you try to load and store to that location, you can raise the exception. That's basically the same function as data watches. So by using the tag memory, you have an infinite number of data watches. Um, one way to use this in security puzzles is you can replace the camera used on the stack. So canary is a kind of production on stack. It's trying to avoid somebody to uh, using stack overflow to change your return address. The way you do it is you use you add a special data uh, just before in between the return address and the stack. So if somebody try to uh, overflow and rewrite the return address, it must write over canary. <laughs> so in this time, instead of using canary, which is actual data, you can just tap the return address. So if somebody wants to write a return address, it will get the exception, so nobody can change it. And another uh, very interesting use is pointing. So this kind of uh, um, data flow tracking, you can just uh, tap any data come from outside work, then you know the tag will propagate with the data as well. Um, then you know this data is coming from where. Okay, this slide is trying to show why um, we, oh, oh sorry, I should mention, in this time we have a optimized tag hash. Uh, I'm trying to tell you why we need this optimized tag hash. So this table comes from our first release. In the first release, we got a very simple tag hash, and that is basically a set of subject tag hash. Um, so in every different column, the size of tag hash is different. So this one only got 16 KB tag hash, and this one got uh, 128 KB tag hash. L2 size is 256 KB. If you can see the number here, if we only use 16 KB tag hash, um, the overhead to the DR memory could be 
uh, could be as up as 94%. So using a cat cache in this scenario doesn't really reduce the memory overhead. This cat cache is not big enough. So in the sign, we think maybe there's a way to still using a small cat cache, but try to reduce this overhead. So basically, uh, try to reduce number from 1.9 to just one. And so our motivation is we found out that a simple set of cache caches inefficient um, um, because it cannot reduce overhead to uh, nearly zero. But there's a pattern in this uh, application. Normally, the application doesn't use much cache, so most of the data on, on cache. <laughs> because most of the data are on, on, on cache, so we think there's maybe a way to try to utilize this pattern to, uh, to reduce overhead. And our target is to say, if your application doesn't really do cache, you shouldn't suffer from this uh, super overhead. <laughs> So our solution is, because we know the data used by the application is not in our cache, so we can use this information to compress our uh, pack cache. That means if, uh, if the data stored in pack cache we know is called zero on set, instead of store the whole cache line of this zero cache, we can just do a single bet to identify the say this cache line is zero. So to do that, we use a multi-level hierarchical cache cache. Um, we have a big map as a higher level table. Um, so if the lower level um, tags are all zero instead of stored that line, we just use a single bit in the big map to identify the zero okay. um, In this case, um, we can kind of guarantee that there will be no overhead for our patient that totally doesn't use that. And this also includes the uh, area efficiency of the tag cache because tag cache, the same size of tag cache, can now cover a huge area of based memory. So this picture actually gives you a logical view of how the hierarchical multilateral tag cache works. Um, every node in the tree is a cache line, and they either store the tag or either store the big map. Uh, the big level, which is called tag tables, are actually the nodes stored in the tag. So you can see here, all nodes actually have a tag will store in the tag cache. If a node doesn't have any tag, the node will not be stored in the tag cache. It will be identified by a principal state in tag map zero. Um, so only if the tag is one, we then store the nodes of the tag table. We have another level of the tag map one. Um, so we, want, we use the same mechanism. If the tag map node is not zero, we will store it in tag cache. If it's not, it's totally zero, then we try to avoid to store it in the cache. And here to do the physical view of the tag position. So here, this one is a physical phase of the memory. Um, if we got one gigabyte of memory, we need to reserve 64 megabytes for the tag partition, so here are all tags. And at what we hide them on this 64 megabytes, we got 128k days reserved for, for the tag map zero. So that's all this level. And then at what we hide end of this, uh, sorry, at what we hide end of this 128k days, we got 256.5 as the top value map. That maps for the top map one. So if your application doesn't actually use any tag, we don't need to store any nodes in tag map zero or tag table. What we need is only 256 bytes in your tag cache. That's all the numbers in this 256 bytes of zero, and it will tell you that no tag is stored in the system. <coughs> This is the hardware structure of the Fortnite tag cache. Um, because the nodes in all levels are of, of the same size, so instead of using three separate caches, we can actually use a single cache to, cache to store all the nodes in all levels. That is a unified cache. So we, we got inside we get three data arrays, we use a single data array and a single memory array. 
Und the memory transaction type is here. Uh, you try to use uh, multiple memory access at the same time. And so, for example, if we got five memory transaction types, that means we can serve five concurrent memory accesses to the PDR memory. But this is quite important, as, as you can recall, we support multiple raw edges. That means um, the PDR may serve multiple concurrent transactions from last level cache, so we must provide concurrent tracks to serve this multi-run GFL2. <coughs> and because the tag cache is using a uniform cache system, um, the access pattern to the cache itself is kind of a standard. And so instead of implementing separate cache access in your net, we try to share a number of cache um, transaction trackers in between of the memory trackers. So that means um, we kind of bank this Cache transaction trackers to each uh, partition of the data array. Um, this will give you some order in the transactions between different memory transaction trackers to the same area of the uniform the data, a uh, uniform the cache array. This is important as we try to uh, get some consistency view of the tag cache, which I will mention later. But anyway, to have multiple tag instruction trackers is to allow the concurrent memory transactions to uh, access the tag array simultaneously. Uh, normally, there's not much write back activities happen, so we can share um, all the tag transaction trackers with a single write back unit, which should be fine. Concurrency is quite important from here. Um, because we need to um, uh, concurrent memory accesses. Um, however, the memory access need to access to different levels of the tag cache. So the whole process is not atomic. And this atomic, uh, non-atomic operation will cause a problem. If two memory memory access, actually two memory access must access different tag tables, but they may access to the same tag map one node or tag map zero node. Um, because the whole process is not atomic, so in between a, a, a single transaction, it may leave the hierarchical tree in a non-consistent view. So to handle this, we need some constraints on how the concurrent memory access to be served. So we've got conditions like um, First, we make sure all access to tag cache arrays must be atomic. So any uh, read or write tag cache data array must be atomic. If something is happening to a single node, nobody else can access the same node at this time. But this doesn't solve the whole problem. So this point is really important. So if a transaction is in process, and any other memory trans transaction is related to this trans transaction, must wait until this transaction leave the whole hierarchical tree in a consistent view. So we have some logic to figure out whether or not two transactions have some relationship in between. If we figure out um, the incoming transaction is kind of related to current uh, operating transactions, we must block this trans transaction until the previous transaction finish. But anyway, if two concurrent transactions are not related to each other, the, the multiple memory transaction trackers will allow them to do concurrently. And some do the big map uh, and, and avoid them to store zero tag nodes. We got some other optimization. Um, for example, we use the bottom up search order rather than top down. Um, so that means, that means in the tree, we will search from the tag table level first. Um, the benefit of this is if we search the tag table level first and get heap, we can immediately say we find this tag and doesn't need to search tag map zero, tag map zero and tag map one. Another benefit for this is if your application use a lot of tags, then for example, you can you can save a lot of nodes from tag table here, and you can replace the node from tag map one and tag map zero out to the memory and use the space of the higher level bitmap to store the real tag. 
of kind of a slightly increase your coverage of attack. There's only one for one time of this. As if your application doesn't really use a lot of attack, then you may lose from the attack data. And then go back until to, to find out actually there's no there's no attack in the type map one. So I need to search three times to figure out that, that really there's no attack. But however, this search is inside the tag hash. So this search doesn't really need any access to the real big DDR memory. This is kind of very fast inside the tag hash. Doesn't really cause actual memory transaction. So it doesn't hurt your uh, throughput overhead. I think this is kind of the uh, whole trade off. Okay, and um, also because we have a bitmap to identify whether there's an empty attack node in your hierarchical attack tree. So we can, include, uh, we can, we can create an empty hash line if we know this node is originally empty. Uh, so in that case, we need to actually factor empty uh, cache line from the DDR memory. And if we find out the dirty uh, cache line inside the attack cache, it's been written to zero. Instead of write it back to the DDR memory, we just avoid this right up. As we know, the bit in the bitmap already tells us this. So next time we can figure, the, figure this out from the bitmaps. Okay, so all this is try to uh, describe the new hierarchical package. And this part from, from this slide, I try to describe the new uh, building support of the data memory in the core pipeline. This slide still say a uh, core pipeline of the local core. Um, and all the gray parts here are the new stuff I added in the core pipeline. So what they do is to try to control the attack propagation in different core pipeline stages and try to do attack chats. In the instruction decoder stage, the attack chat block will check whether or not the instruction attack is what we want. So if the, the attack of the instruction is a mismatch, we will erase the exception. And in the execution stage, um, the attack processor will control the attack uh, propagation from the source register to destination register for, for all the AOU operations. And the checker will check whether or not some source, uh, some tags of the source register is matching with matching with our, our expectation. In the memory stage, um, um, the tag propagation will propagate tags to the list register. This is used for branch. So sometimes we need to uh, set a tag for the return address. That's why we need to set a tag to the list register. And this one is quite interesting. We can also check the instruction tag of the jump packet. What this means is, sometimes for a branch, we want to tap the target address. But at this point, we don't know where is the target, and we haven't got that instruction into the pipeline, so we can't directly do that. So we, instead of tapping the target address, we tap the PC. We store a tag into the PC, and then um, at the next cycle, the PC tag will compare with the instruction tag to check whether or not the target address has the task you expected. So this is what say the, the instruction task in the jump target. And this is done in the memory stage, basically because it's the first stage before write back. And for the L1D cache, we have a task propagation unit here, trying to propagate tasks from a rest of file to memory or from memory to rest of file. So that's how the tags can propagate into your caches and finally into your DDR memory. And we also have a check to check whether or not the memory tag uh, is matched with our expectation. Um, the system uh, is assumed to start from a zero state. That means all <coughs> tags or all memory locations are zero. Um, to actually use a task, we must have some mechanism to set the initial task. So we provide two special instructions, one is task read and task write. The task write instruction uh, is, is trying to write this number. 
So you can have a number in uh, RS1 or have that number in real number. Basically, you can use the output of this equation as a new tag for the subsequent reference. Um, the function of this one is simply say you can set a tag to certain register. And tag read is basically you can read a tag from a certain register and then send it to Wait. this is wrong. I should have said that. Um, so this this one is basically you can read a tag of a register, then uh, save it to the register file so you can kind of using your ALU functions to change the tag. The functions of all tag propagation and tag checkers are controlled by a single CSR, which is so, uh, called, not a single CSR, but a CSR called tag control CSR. And then you've got the shadow CSRs in, in white mode and user mode. The real CSR is machine level tag control CSR. It have a set of, mark, set of masks. So each mask control a component <coughs> in labs. So every, every box here has a single mask which can control the function. You can use that mask to decide which tag bit is used in by, by the CNN and whether or not you want to enable or disable this tag of propagation. And all the masks are stored in the tag control CSR. And machine mode has the full control of this. In the supervisor mode, you may have the full control of the CSR, but there's a, a control requester. So you can kind of decide what mask you can rewrite in the uh, supervisor mode. And furthermore, you can decide which mask you can write in the user mode. Um, when you use the tags for some user mode applications like infinite data watches, you may allow the user mode to change some tags. But for security reasons, you may dis disallow the user mode to change tags. In that case, you may dis disable all the tags, disable all the right to tag control CSR. So that's why we have defined three different CSRs and two tag control CSR control. Um, to kind of decide what is possible. We also add tags for different CSRs. For example, we add tags to the exception PC and to the scrap registers, and here is um, the exception vector. These are kind of special functions to allow you to tap the interrupt handler. So for some security reason, you may, uh, you may allow you to jump to certain Secure trust the program, and then you can set tags to make sure the exception handler is trustable. Here's a simple use case for the tag memory for, for code point and production. So we can use a single bit tag called CPR. Um, we can tag the instruction. That means um, we disallow and install to the instruction. So if there's no, no tag bit set, we are not allowed to change this. Pointed. We can also tag target address. That means if the target address is not tagged, we can, cannot jump there. And so if a hacker hacks the no return address, the return address points to a non tagged address. This jump will be illegal. It will raise the exception. It can only jump to the legal positions where the return address is tagged. Also, we can tag the RS1 when we do an indirect jump. So uh, this is kind of abstract protection to make sure you, you've got some legal instruction to use in indirect jump. Okay, uh, those are for the tag memory support in the full pipeline. And this one is the part for the maintenance system. So here is a internal view of the maintenance subsystem. You can see here is the Popino core. And this popular core is snapped to a lot of I.O. devices. So all these I.O. devices are now controlled by the media system rather than directly snapped to the HI function in the cap. <coughs> and currently the communication between the application calls and media calls are using a shared 64 uh, KV program memory. So the communication between uh, the rogue and media are currently not in any co coherence control. This is not perfect. So in our view, we should add some coherent I/O um, communication there. 
in Alhamdulillah, it will be done in the next days. Um, for the current SD interface for the US Dominion, we already support atomic speed detection, um, but we set the speed to 5 megahertz by default. Um, we allow you to mount the SD as a fat, uh, fat partition into your lens kernel, and we support the read and write operation. Um, currently, SD drive is actually running on the rocket core in the application core. Soon we will move this drive on to the medium core. Um, as you know, we provide, both products provide a flexible boot procedure, so you can have a multiple mastery in your system. The simplest one probably is done on boot, so you put your bit screen onto the onboard flash, and FPGA will configure by the, by the flash. And then Berkeley boot will, 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 you know, the first stage boot will, will, will load the Berkeley boot loader and this kernel from the SD card into the VR memory, and then jump to the Berkeley boot loader loading the Linux. You can also do that by using Revival tools to configure the stream from Revival uh, on your host machine. And, and once the base room is inside that network, then you can do the same, just load everything from SD. And because we already got the traceback, okay. And so you can load your image using your traceback directly to VDR memory and jump then jump to your VDR memory to load your stack. This allows you to, do, to change your FPGA image at one time. We have some other development loadings as well. We soon will uh, provide a GMU minion uh, emulation system to allow you to run rocket on your host machine, then connect to a minion core running in real RPG to debug your minion core system. And uh, if you know Alex Bradbury in Canberra is currently doing the LLVM port for the spy. Um, according to his information, this kind of 90% of the PCC port is made have been done and the uh, whole sport should be finished uh, in this year. We also have a Google Summer Code sport in this year. All right, here shows you all the website where you can get the code, talk to the real documents or the Rolex website. Um, uh, the next one now is the tutorial is still on the pipeline right now. It will come out in a week's time, so it's not ready. All now the codes are ready. Thank you. Hi, Wei. So, I'm Bo from the National Community Institute. So, about tech support, do we need to uh, do any modification uh, at the code, at the C level? Is, is it the compiler will help us do that? That will support. Uh, yeah, actually, that is quite a good question. So, in our system, uh, after the power up, the tags are all zero. So, we need some initial code to set up the initial tags. Of course, there's two ways to do it. One is you have actually instructions to set the initial tags in, in the class application, so you can really set tags in the, in the machine mode. The, the other way is to change your compiler, so set tags in your binaries, then change your EDF loader to load the code and your tags at the same time into your EDF memory. Um, I think the easy way is to use a initial code to set tags. Um, also, the, the way how to use tag memory to actually support security or support other general use cases is under defining right now. Um, this hardware release is just a big way first support in hardware. How software utilizes in this feature is still under discussion. Um, I should say it's a whole question. <laughs> 